From Four Points by Sheraton, Victoria Island, Lagos, Nigeria, in association with NTA, You Can't Beat the Rich, Channels Television, a network built on trust, Ebony Live TV, Africa's first global black entertainment and lifestyle network, Biscon TV, the People Station, Hip TV, a break from the norm, Galaxy TV, reaching for the stars, Brilla FM, Beats FM, Classic FM, TVC, AIT, Ray Power, Encomium Weekly, MP Arts, Top Seed Visuals, Yes Magazine, Agilent Wireless, City People Magazine, Network Tentacles, ShowbizPlus.com, Sound City, National Films and Video Sensors Board, Bang TV, Federal Ministry of Information and Culture, and Powered by Tops, the Entertainment Headquarters. Copyright Society of Nigeria welcomes you as Nigeria's best brains come together for an intellectual property first. Under the distinguished chairmanship of the father of intellectual property law in Nigeria, Professor Emeritus Egetin E. Uviagara, discussing intellectual property rights in the new global knowledge economy. Keynote speaker, Geoffrey Gideofo Kwosike Onyama, Honorable Minister of Foreign Affairs. Guest speaker, Mr. Basil Udotai. Lawyer, managing partner, technology advisors. On the distinguished panel, Mr. Obi Asika. Corson board member and co-founder, Cabal Entertainment. Mr. Mena Ajokbovi. Lawyer, chairman, Nigerian Bar Association section on business law. Mrs. Uche Uka. Economist, group head, creative desk, bank of industry. Mr. Emeka Mba. Former DG, National Film and Video Census Board. Former DG, National Broadcasting Commission. Yes, you never had it so good. Welcome one and all to the 2017 Coson Lecture. Professor Egerton of Vegara to say a few words to us. Chairman of Neri Maxa. Permit me to say that I'm 81 years old. <laughs> if I make any errors, put them down to courage. Uh, I'm very grateful that I'm made chairman today. Grateful to Corson. I'm also grateful to, in particular, to Chief Tony Okoroje. Tony and I have come a long way. The details you can find out if you're interested. I know Tony is very brilliant. He's hardworking. And above all, he's a perfectionist. Don't want to work. If you are idle, indolent, don't go near Tony. Go near him, those virtues you should be able to display. The title of today's lecture is given, we all know the title. Uh, I'm an anal analog man. <laughs> I'm of the ancient, if you like. At Government College, really, which I attended, 
if you enter the school 60 years, 50 years, I think, and over, you are regarded as an ancient mariner. Our motto in Uvili is uh, the ship. So a uh, marina, anybody who gets admitted into that college is called a marina. If you were admitted 60 years and above, you are an ancient marina. And I think that has been of analog era. Today we're about to talk about, um, I believe, digital age. Before we gloss over some of the achievements which we made, Tony and I in particular, at the analog era, I will mention one, and we can only build on that. Before the 80s, recording companies, Philip, Decca, all the others, made huge profits on the talent of Nigerians. Because they had money, they record our artists and sell and pay a pittance. Tony and I changed all that in the copyright act. And today, while I cannot say categorically that the bank is wealthy because of what we did, but I believe we contributed to his wealth. I believe we've done that. In the digital age, you can only add to that. Thank you very much. Uh, let me invite to speak to us on the subject of intellectual property in the new knowledge economy, a distinguished Nigerian, first class Nigerian in every way, a wonderful person, our own Minister of Foreign Affairs, Mr. Geoffrey Onyama. Good afternoon, uh, everybody. There's so many distinguished uh, dignitaries uh, here today. It's quite a challenge for me to um, acknowledge all of them. But first and foremost, the inimitable, one and only Chief Tony Okoroji. Um, it's really a great honor and a great pleasure for me to be here today. And of course, Professor Oviegara and um, some of the ones I know, because I don't have a list of all the dignitaries here. Um, Asika uh, Mekamba, uh, who I know, of course, Professor Bambo, and, uh, and all the others that uh, I hope to get to know better uh, today. Um, as I said, it's, it's truly a great uh, uh, honor, a great privilege to be here with, uh, with all of you today. You know, um, as, uh, as Chief Tony said, uh, three years ago, I was the Deputy Director General of the World Intellectual Property Organization in Geneva. And um, I had the bright, but some might say not so bright, idea to challenge my boss, the Director General, for his position of Director General of the organization. And I was 18 months from retirement. I had spent 30 years in the organization. And um, I didn't win in the end. It was relatively close. And uh, so, of course, I did the honorable thing and uh, resigned or retired, uh, took early retirement. And I was clearing out my office. And I had, of course, for 30 years, I had lectured in many countries around the world. And so I had a lot of notes and uh, various uh, documents, books. But I said, well, I'm not going to have anything more to do with intellectual property. I'm going to turn over that page. I don't need this. And I threw them all away and uh, said that was, as far as I was concerned, my lot with intellectual property. 30 years, not marriage, but maybe partnership. So I didn't require a formal divorce. And um, so it was quite a simple matter throw them away and move on. And I came back to Nigeria, uh, a retiree. Now, as I said, I really didn't know I would have to talk about intellectual property ever again. But the legendary persuasive powers of Chief Tony Okoroji, who 
invited me to this event and uh, kept reminding me about it a number of months ago meant that I somehow have to try and dust the atrophied knowledge, if I had any knowledge at all, um, dust up again uh, very, very quickly. So I'll try and speak to you about what I can remember from those years of intellectual property. You know, there was a judge that talked about somebody doing his uh, incompetent best. So um, I'll do <laughs> my incompetent uh, uh, best. But um, so I'm just letting you know that uh, uh, since I'm no longer in the field and I haven't been for, for three years or more now, um, do forgive me for any uh, shortcomings. And um, and it's true also as. Uh, Chief Tony said, um, you know, the president of Cote d'Ivoire was arriving today. I had done some of the arrangement, and ordinarily I really needed to be there. But, um, but I said that I really would have to be here. But another reason why I really wanted to be here is the great admiration and pride I have for Nigeria's creative industries. Nollywood, the, the, the musical industry, uh, it's such a source of great pride for us. Um, we're going through a period where the image of Nigeria has been so severely dented by you know, so many different things. And, um, and these two industries really stand out as beacons, beacons of hope and a source of tremendous pride. And I cannot congratulate Chief Tony enough for what he has done in this industry. Uh, the creation of COSON, um, I know from WIPO, um, engaging with the copyright uh, uh, um, sector in Nigeria, and indeed intellectual property sector in Nigeria, uh, what a real achievement it is. The, the, the dynamism and the sheer energy and drive that is required to create a, um, you know, such a, a, an outfit is really one that um, is, is, is not easy for one person, well, not one person, but for an individual really to drive it with the force that he has done. And uh, for those reasons, I, uh, I really felt that I had to be here uh, today to, um, you know, to share with you the successes of uh, our creative industries and also to share with you my incompetent knowledge of the subject matter. So, um, you know, intellectual property, knowledge economy, because we are in a knowledge economy now, and this is the economy that is generating tremendous wealth around the world. Um, that's completely transformed uh, our world uh, of today. Years gone by, and still to a certain extent today, the bricks and mortars, land, um, are really the sources of wealth. Manufacturing, agriculture, industry, um, are usually what we rely on for wealth creation. But the knowledge economy has really come and new sources of wealth, of intangible wealth, uh, has really dawned. And, um, and how we in Nigeria especially can put in place the building blocks to tap into that, to create the wealth, to use that as the engine and the motor for the development of our country is really the challenge. Because we have seen that countries without those natural resources I've talked about, there's no petroleum, no crude oil, and, uh, and other things, how some of them are transforming themselves, you know, because of these intangible assets, really plugging in to the knowledge economy today and delivering real dividends for their country. We even see like Silicon Valley and places like that in California that through their knowledge-based so, uh, uh, companies and uh, organizations have really been able to catapult California as a state uh, into the seventh richest, if it were a country, a country in the world. So 
it's vitally important that we take advantage and that we plug in to the knowledge uh, economy of the world uh, today. And so I want to talk about what it means and uh, the elements, the challenges, where we are in Nigeria in that regard, and what we really should be doing to try to really exploit and, um, and key in to the knowledge uh, economy. Intellectual property is the basis of it, really. It provides the incentive, because the philosophy of intellectual property protection is to provide a limited period of protection of commercial exclusivity. And during this period of exclusivity, it could be 20 years for patents, uh, 15 years renewable for trademarks, a lifetime plus 70 years for copyright, but in any case, a period of exclusivity for the creator. During that period, the creator has a monopoly, that exclusive right, that he can exploit or she can exploit the, uh, the benefits and the fruits of the labor and the investment and um, recoup um, you know, costs of investment and so forth. And um, it's this incentive that drives people to be creative and to have this creative society. I, intellectual property, property rights covers copyright protection for literary, musical, artistic works, and other related rights. Patent protection covers inventions. Design protection covers the ornamental aesthetic uh, uh, aspects of, of objects. And trademarks and service marks, of course, protect you know, goods and services. Geographical indications uh, protects indications of source. Now, COSON is the Copyright Society of Nigeria. It's a musical collecting society charged by its members, the artists, with the task of collecting royalties on their behalf for any reproduction or performance of their music anywhere in the world. And often to achieve this, Kosong would have to enter into agreements with other collecting societies around the world and uh, have reciproc reciprocal uh, uh, arrangements uh, for that. Nigeria is also a party to some international conventions uh, in the field of intellectual property. And it's important, really, because you know, the knowledge economy is about, very often about ideas. It's about, you know, and these are not tangible. So it's not as if your customs can you know, uh, 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 seize them at the point of entry. Ideas cross frontiers, they're not seen. So you need an international convention uh, to be able to um, enforce the respect for intellectual property rights. And um, as far as copyright is concerned, which covers musical works, uh, of course, the, the Berne Convention for the Protection of uh, Literary and Artistic and Musical Works uh, is the premier international convention uh, for that. And, um, and of course, the treaty provides protection for an author or a composer of uh, musical works. And as I said, usually for a duration, because we're at Kosong being a musical society, talking about, I'll, I'll focus more on the copyright sector. Um, most of the countries of the world now have a protection period of the lifetime of the author or the, the composer and then 50 or 70 years after. And um, so even after the death of an author, the, um, the heirs, the estate, still can have that copyright protection. And uh, it's an exclusive right that, uh, that continues. And, um, and typically, you know, um, this protection the permission can also be given by the author through a license or whatever for other people to, um, to perform those works. 
And you see a lot of that in the musical world today, where you know, uh, people sample you know, from other people's songs and so forth. Or you know, also produce uh, uh, and sing other people's uh, songs and so forth. So the, the author has that right, and often for, for a fee. And you know, a perfect example that really captures all this is a recent case that just took place um, with um, the recording artist, American recording artist, uh, Pharrell, who I'm sure some of the younger ones would know. Professor Viagra might not, but some of the younger ones. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> but, but the American artist Pharrell and uh, Robin Thicke, you recall that they had a massive hit song um, you'll probably remember the video with uh, ladies walking up, yeah, scantily attired, and some people considered it a bit risque, uh, that, uh, that video. And um, it was a song, Blurred Lines, you know, that was a massive international hit. But, you know, uh, for those of you who are maybe a bit older, you would have re recalled maybe a certain artist by the name of Marvin Gaye. And uh, he had a hit song called Got to Give It Up. And um, so the um, eagle-eyed ones, or I would say sharp-eared uh, uh, ones, noticed the similarity between the two songs. And, um, but of course Marvin Gaye was already dead, uh, had been dead for, you know, for a number of years. But the 70 years I was talking about after the life of an author, which the US uh, employs, meant his family could sue and, um, and you know what? They won for copyright, that the similarity was, uh, was strong enough, and they were awarded $7.4 million. Not bad, huh? <laughs> so, so, um, so that's copyright uh, uh, for you. Now, the World Intellectual Property Organization, where I spent 30 years of my life with, uh, is one of the specialized agencies of the United Nations. And, um, and it was created in part based on the assumption that there was a significant causal relationship between intellectual property, technology transfer, and development. And that's very important. So that belief that intellectual property is a source for technology transfer and that will lead to development. So of course that's very attractive for developing countries, you know, and you know, there's and you know, the reality is that the countries and the individuals that own most of the intellectual property rights uh, in the world, especially patents, are from the industrialized countries, and uh, so this there's quite an issue on this, which I'll you know uh, touch on uh, going forward as to you know, whether intellectual property uh, is being sufficiently exploited by developing countries and whether developing countries are not at a disadvantage with regards to intellectual property because, um, but you'll see the reason uh, as, I, as I go on. And um, WIPO, WIPO, World Intellectual Property Organization, declares itself, and I quote, to be dedicated to developing a balanced and accessible intellectual property system which rewards creativity, stimulates innovation, and contributes to economic development while safeguarding the public interest. Because intellectual property at the end of the day, as you see with the Marvin Gaye situation, you're giving a monopoly, you know, and um, society is often uh, against monopolies and, um, and believes that the public, uh, there's a public interest uh, dimension and that the public should benefit. Uh, and so we try to strike a balance between the public, society benefiting and rewarding somebody um, who has expended a lot to come up with creations, be it music or any other thing. It's also important because that will be an incentive uh, for those people. And an interesting side story I will talk about is um, in the early days of intellectual property, which started probably in the, around the 16th uh, uh, century in Venice, uh, in Italy, there was, um, you know, I don't know 
those of you who are more classical music inclined uh, will probably be aware of a musical instrument, a violin actually, called the Stradivarius violin. Now, if you want to buy a Stradivarius violin today, you would have to pay maybe two million or more dollars. And um, why? Because there are so few of them in existence, but also because of the quality of the sound of the violin, the Stradivarius. So it's one of the uh, greatest possession a, uh, a classical musician can have. But interestingly, Stradivarius was an Italian violin maker that lived in Italy 16 something century, 17th, 16th century. And, um, and so his violin has survived with those qualities. But one can also say that Stradivarius, obviously, in those days, you didn't have a settled intellectual property system. So the process that he used to make those kinds of violins with that kind of quality of sound, he obviously kept secret, you know, passing it on maybe from family generations down. And what this means, of course, is that, yes, he was successful in selling his violins, but society, of course, lost out after he died because he dies with his knowledge. So that's the objective of intellectual property, so that people don't die with their knowledge and society can benefit. I mean, can you imagine if it was known, the process that he went through, then you wouldn't have to pay 20, uh, 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 two or three million dollars for a violin today, because that process would have been known. But then it would have been important that he be given an opportunity to at least uh, reap the benefits of that. So the intellectual property system is really that system that you know, strikes that balance um, you know, between the creator and rewarding the creator and society, society benefiting from, um, from the works uh, of, the, uh, of the creator. So this premise of the relationship between intellectual property rights and economic development is repeated in um, a very important intellectual property treaty called the Agreement on Trade-Related Aspects of Intellectual Property Rights. This is the TRIPS Agreement. And the TRIPS Agreement is uh, part of a suite of agreements which make up the World Trade Organization. Article 7 of that TRIPS Agreement declares that the protection and enforcement of intellectual property rights should contribute to the promotion of technological innovation and to the transfer and dissemination of technology. You might ask, of course, but what's intellectual property doing in the World Trade Organization? And, um, and it's, but again, we'll, we'll come to that uh, uh, later, I think. So, but whether or not this is the case, in other words, whether intellectual property really does that, because there are some people who believe that it does not necessarily do that, but, uh, but whether or not that's the case. Nigeria, as a member of the World Trade Organization, is obliged to implement and enforce the intellectual property provisions of the TRIPS agreement in order to secure trade and other advantages that come with Nigeria being a member of the World Trade Organization. And also, because of the influence <clears throat> of the World Trade Organization, it's an expectation of international investors who want to come and invest in Nigeria that a country will have an intellectual property system which complies with the provisions of the TRIPS agreement. And, um, you know, and when you look at the provisions of the TRIPS agreement, you know, you, it's something that was negotiated by member countries. And of course the question, but again we'll come to that a bit later, of how Nigeria engaged during those uh, negotiations and uh, what the consequences uh, of our active engagement or non-active engagement uh, has been. But um, the OECD, the organization of um, economic, and, uh, economic cooperation and uh, development. It's uh, an organization that has mainly 
countries, the most industrialized countries, in a 2003 report or study, noted a positive correlation between intellectual property protection and foreign direct investment uh, in a country. So <clears throat> given the intellectual property rights obligations which the World Trade Organization imposes, it's therefore very important for countries like Nigeria to identify the advantages for itself in the international intellectual property uh, system. And, you know, when we look at it, in fact, the musical industry and the film industry is a perfect illustration of how things change uh, in countries as countries evolve. You know, once upon a time, of course, we were real consumers of films and music from other countries, you know. And so, you know, piracy to us then would not have been a big issue, you know. In fact, on the contrary, you know, we, growing up as, uh, you know, the older ones here, most of the music we bought would be pirated and, you know, American musicians, British musicians, and so forth. And we had no problems and no compunction about doing it uh, in those days. But you know the term, a poacher turned gamekeeper. Um, so now we are, we are now producing our own music, consuming most of what we produce, and also our own films. So, and we want to keep the industry alive. It uh, generates jobs, goodwill, and uh, promoting trade. And so, of course, we are now much more you know, um, thoughtful about the whole issue of intellectual property rights protection. And um, so that change has taken place. And very often, you know, uh, in these international treaties, as we go to negotiate, we should always be negotiating according to our own interests. And it does require, for that reason, that we are really uh, keyed into the substance of the issues. And I believe that that's why we should not have this divide between the government, because it's invariably the government that goes to negotiate in these intergovernmental organizations, but also the real stakeholders should be very much part uh, of that process. And we see with China, you know, for instance, in the area of trademarks and patents, you know, for many years uh, it's been considered uh, the country, maybe the champion for infringement of intellectual property rights. Uh, but now, as China is now beginning to produce a lot more of its own uh, uh, goods and services and uh, of a higher quality, they're now you know, responding more to the issues of protection and respect of intellectual property rights. So, intellectual property rights and the knowledge economy. As I said, it's been pointed out that the establishment of intellectual property rights systems is one response to a more gener a generic and fundamental problem, which is how to improve the knowledge ecology of countries. We want to improve the knowledge capacity and uh, ecosystem in Nigeria in the sense of creating and improving national institutions that enable the production, access, and use of knowledge. If we're going to be competitive in the knowledge economy, we have to have the building blocks in place. Uh, we can't just rely on one computer whiskey or Antonio Koroji, uh, or, you know, we really have to build the capacity, the national capacity. For developing countries, the establishment of knowledge-based industries offers an opportunity for economic development that will in fact leapfrog the necessity of transition through heavy industries. It's really a once in a lifetime opportunity to, you know, we're far back in, in, uh, in, in the industrialization process, you know, and we can actually leapfrog you know, into the 21st century knowledge economy and be competitive in that economy. And we're seeing a lot of the Asian tigers and others doing that. India, the outsourcing, you know, uh, of a lot of the 
uh, um, IT uh, services, you know, to those countries. So they're all muscling in to the knowledge uh, economy and uh, leaving all the manual and labor intensive industries. So for example, the economic recovery and growth plan that this government has uh, in place and has just come out with as a roadmap for the development of this country, quote, encourages the use of science, technology, and innovation to drive growth. So we, the government, recognizes the importance of the knowledge economy and the importance of Nigeria really keying into it. And this is recognized in our economic recovery and growth plan. And even poorer countries, smaller countries than Nigeria, like Rwanda, for instance, has announced information and communication technology, ICT plans, as an engine for accelerated development and economic growth, for national prosperity, and for global competitiveness. South Africa um, has a national development plan. And in that national development plan, it talks about an intensive pursuit of knowledge economy to diversify the economy by moving away from the current over-reliance on commodities and non-tradable services. It recognizes that knowledge, innovation, and technology are increasingly becoming the drivers of progress, growth, and wealth. And so it recognizes that South Africa needs to transition towards a knowledge economy and away from over-reliance on natural resources. And that's the same here. We want to diversify. Mr. President has talked about diversification of the economy. But, um, but the knowledge economy and keying into that is really where it's at at this moment in time globally. So what are we doing about that? Keying into the knowledge economy. How can we do it? What are the steps that we need to take? Well, Nigeria has introduced, um, has an IP policy uh, of sorts uh, to create a legal infrastructure to enable it to make the transition to a knowledge economy. Um, I say of sorts because, you know, I remember when I was at the World Intellectual Property Organization, I was actually in charge of, uh, of Africa, so covering also Nigeria. And um, I was very attracted by uh, the idea of an IP audit to know where a gap analysis of the intellectual property situation in developing countries. You know, because if you want to develop, I was very keen that we should try and develop an intellectual property uh, strategy that will lead a policy and a strategy, you know, to really exploit it for Nigeria's development. And, um, you know, and we, we, I started the process, you know, uh, actually. And um, as I said, this was essentially a gap uh, analysis to get the situation uh, in this country, uh, of IP in the country. But, you know, I later moved on. We, we created the, the mechanisms the roadmap for it, identified the institution that we wanted to carry it out, and the methodology uh, we developed, and um, you know, and had a training program for those to carry it out. But I moved on later, and um, you know, with other uh, portfolios. So, and uh, unfortunately, I don't think it was really taken to the log to its logical conclusion. But the nucleus is there, and we really have to move towards, um, towards a proper IP uh, uh, policy and strategy for, for, this, uh, for this country. We, we need that uh, a legal, legal base. So the IPR, intellectual property policy formulation, um, following on from the importance of formulating an IP policy to under, underpin Nigeria's embrace of the knowledge economy, it's also important for the country to undertake intellectual property policy capacity building. And this involves the establishment of an institutional capacity as well as a substantive capacity for IP policy formulation 
among government officials um, because IP rights um, are managed by the government, uh, the regulators. And it's important that, you know, that capacity should be, should be there uh, in the country. Otherwise, it will be very, very difficult to fully exploit the benefits of the intellectual property system. And when in WIPO, we spent a lot of time and a lot of resources on capacity building uh, here in Nigeria with government officials and also, you know, private sector, um, you know, um, officers. But it's important to have that architecture, that policy architecture uh, in place. A particular complication, though, with intellectual property policy is the fact that intellectual property is a cross-cutting subject matter issue. Um, so it's very, very difficult to, um, to know where to situate the, 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 the policy center in any country. And different countries have the intellectual property office you know, in different ministries. In some countries, even with the, in the presidency, um, because some of those countries believe that's how important intellectual property uh, is. In some countries, Ministry of Commerce, and then of course, intellectual property covers patents for inventions, trademarks, the trade area, um, copyright in the musical area. So you will have different ministries that are involved in intellectual property. And in reality, the culture ministry, in fact, uh, copyright used to be in the, in the, in the Ministry of Culture. And it was moved to the Ministry of Justice, for instance. Uh, education, uh, Ministry of Education, you know, we're talking about books, licensing books, and copyright for textbooks, you know. Um, the, um, even foreign relations, of course, because these are international treaties that you're going to be engaging in. And intellectual property, if nothing else, is a global uh, issue. Health, uh, we've seen the big uh, fight uh, over the years in the health sector, especially with anti-retrovirals uh, in South Africa. You recall the big battle against the pharmaceuticals, you know, and the IP uh, uh, making that av available between uh, uh, patented products and generics and so forth in the, in the pharmaceutical sector. So the health, in the health industry, justice, science, uh, trade, these are all uh, 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 sectors that are concerned with um, intellectual property rights. So a government has to be really focused uh, to get the coherence that is required to exploit intellectual property with those diverse sectors all engaging in intellectual property and to have uh, you know, national uh, priorities that are set, strategies that are set will require you know, that coherence and that cooperation between all the different sectors, not to talk, of course, of the users, the stakeholders themselves. And we saw this, I go back to it, uh, I said I was coming back to it later, coming to it later, with the World Trade Organization. When we're negotiating the Uruguay round, um, trade negotiations, a lot of the developing countries, like, you know, African countries, would go with the nodal offices, Ministry of Trade maybe is, in, is responsible for trademarks, so they would go. Well, the TRIPS agreement covers so many different sectors, there are health issues and so forth. So, you know, a lot of provisions were put in there. Developing countries did not engage, as we should have done. And now we're looking to, you know, amendments to the TRIPS agreement, trying to reopen those agreements. So that's why it's important to have that capacity uh, in government to be able to go to these treaties and, um, and bend them to our own interests and, uh, and aspirations. Um, but even at the international level, intellectual property is not always easy to situate. Of course, the World Intellectual Property Organization is the obvious organization that's responsible for intellectual property, but there are other international organizations that also deal with uh, intellectual property. There's a convention on biological diversity. Um, biotechnology is also a big area in intellectual property now. The FAO, Food and Agriculture Organization, the United Nations Environmental Program, the UNESCO, of course, which deals with cultural uh, issues and also uh, scientific and uh, issues as well. The uh, UNIDO, 
the United Nations Industrial Development Organization, the World Customs Organization, the World Health Organization, the World Trade Organization. So, so many different organizations are dealing with uh, intellectual property. And an obvious consequence of this involvement by so many international organizations and national ministries in the formulation of intellectual property policy is the difficulty of securing a nationally and internationally consistent approach, as I said, in relation to common subjects. Science, technology, and innovation policy is another in important policy to have in a knowledge economy and to really engage with the knowledge economy. Central to the establishment of a knowledge economy is the establishment of institutions for the analysis of technologies that can be adapted, absorbed, and diffused. So your science, technology, and innovation policy can develop to support, can be developed rather to support the intellectual property offices and encourage intellectual property uh, rights awareness as well as to support the technology transformation capacity building and innovation of enterprises. And also, STIP uh, can also improve linkages between the research and development uh, uh, industries uh, sectors and industry sectors and can also enhance national, regional and international dialogue in the areas of science, technology and innovation. So the central thrust of the industry policies should be the nurturing and promotion of small and medium-sized enterprises as the key drivers of the economy through the development of an innovative and technologically strong base. So that industry policy should recognize innovation as the key enabler of economic growth and should seek to nurture an innovation culture among enterprises. That's just the only way you, know, you can have um, that economic, that uh, a strong uh, knowledge economy based industries. Information and communication technologies, ICT policies, is really, really important because of the role that ICT is playing now, uh, a core uh, role in the knowledge economy. Copyright protection stands at the heart of ICT policy. As a reality for a number of African countries, is that this is a precondition for foreign investment and technology transfer. However, a country like Nigeria, for us, copyright protection also has a number of conflicting implications. For many years, Nigeria has had to accommodate the high costs of access to printed words, such as textbooks. The digital copyrights that stand at the heart of contemporary knowledge, contemporary knowledge industries, are largely in the hands of, as I said earlier, major industrialized nations, which places Nigeria at a significant disadvantage. The intellectual property holders, rights holders, are not in Africa, not in Nigeria. So we have to spend a lot of money you know, negotiating and generally at their mercy. So these are the, some of the conflicts. So in looking for policy options, you know, on the one hand, yes, we want to protect uh, Nollywood, uh, musical industries um, in the context of information and communication technology. But on the other hand, we are not really the owners of um, of most of the copyright of the intellectual property uh, in the world today. So the United Nations Economic Commission for Africa in uh, 1996 launched the African Information Society Initiative as an attempt to bridge the digital divide between Africa and the rest of the world. And it was a, a framework for a radical socio-economic transformation through deployment and exploitation of ICTs in the context of globalization and the information age. So how are we in Nigeria engaging really with ICT now today? Um, the best person to hear it from, of course, is the Minister of Communication, Adebayo Oshitu. 
And uh, this month, in a key note speech at the uh, Sixth European Union Nigeria Business Forum in Lagos, he said that um, the Nigeria has invested over $60 billion in the ICT sector since 2001, when digital mobile services were launched. And he stressed that the federal government has been conscious of the role ICT plays in national development and so has been committed for over 15 years to ensuring that ICT facilities and services were expanded rapidly. The minister noted that the government is addressing the issue of investment in ICT infrastructure and ICT education and regulation in order to build on the successes of the digital revolution and said that we are mindful of the fact that youth play a key role in developing the ICT sector and we are putting in place the right business environment and regulatory framework to allow our young people to unlock all the potential of digital economy. And, uh, and he went on to say that globally, ICT had become a veritable tool for advancing growth and economic development, especially in countries endowed with certain resources. That ICT has changed the way people communicate, the way people learn, and the way people conduct businesses. And he stated that a World Bank economic, uh, econometric study in 2009 showed that every 10% increase in ICT investment generates a 1.3% uh, increase in GDP. So invest 10% in your ICT sector and you're going to get an increase in your GDP. He also said that Nigeria the Nigerian IP, uh, ICT sector today is one of the fastest growing, despite the economic recession. And said that the country was leveraging on ICT to drive transparency in governance and improve the quality and cost effectiveness of public service delivery. And finally, he said that in order for the ICT sector to supplement or replace oil and gas sector, that we have to put in place strong policy frameworks which favors the sector. As he said, finally, we want the ICT sector to be the cash cow for our nation. And that is really at the core of the knowledge-based global economy. But if we look at intellectual property rights and ICT, what I would call ICT policy overreach, it's good we have to have in place uh, the appropriate policies but sometimes there can also be an overreach. So although the formulation of intellectual property rights and information and communication technology policies has provided some clarity for the international investment community, sometimes these policies have met with condemnation because of their overreach. For example, in the area of access to medicines, as I mentioned earlier, the South African draft intellectual property policy of 2017 has been criticized by the international pharmaceutical sector for exceeding the TRIPS compulsory license provisions. You know, when I was talking about the balance between intellectual property rights holders and society and that balance we're trying to have, um, it gives governments the possibility, especially in the case of medicines, uh, if the price is too high, because you're giving a monopoly to the person that has the patent on the medicines. But if really, you know, you have a, a health emergency, um, you know, cow, uh, cow, what's this uh, latest one now? This uh, cow pox or, or, or monkey pox or whatever. Oh, yeah. they have. <laughs> so, you know, if a pharmaceutical company outside the, the, the country comes up with a vaccine or something, a quick remedy, they, and they, they, they get a patent, they have the right, of course, to supply that. But if they're now, which is what often happens when you give a monopoly, they now charge too high a price that we can't afford it to treat our people and we're having economic problems. The government can uh, issue compulsory licenses under the TRIPS agreement of the WTO, but there are certain you know, things that have to be in place before negotiating with the people, the right price, and so forth. But the South Africans you know, just went ahead and put uh, you know, in place, some are saying, um, you know, a very low bar for the government uh, to decide whether to issue a compulsory license uh, or not. So that's also an issue with overreach uh, sometimes, whether the policy itself 
is, uh, is an overreach. And in relation to ICT, you know, the U.S., and I think this is something we have not done in the past and we really should have been doing a lot more of, and that's that when we go to international organizations to negotiate international treaties, and I always try to push for it. It has to be driven by the stakeholders. There has to be, because very often the reality is that there is a divide between government and the stakeholders. But the stakeholders should be the ones that are informing policy, informing government policy. And Mr. President has been excellent on this, I must say, just a slight digression. Uh, as you know, the EU wants to have a partnership agreement with, uh, with Africa. And, um, and they've been really pressuring a lot of African countries to sign up to this, and it's something that comes after the, um, the African, Caribbean, and Pacific uh, agreement between the EU and uh, Africa to facilitate trade. So now they're pushing a new one, and they're doing it with different sub-regions of Africa. And, um, and almost all the African countries have signed up, the ECOWAS countries, but Mr. President said no. That is going to put our manufacturers out of, out of business, because if you give you know, a, a, a Europe, which has a very, very strong manufacturing base, a much easier access to the uh, African ECOWAS market than all our small nascent industries, uh, our manufacturing sec sec uh, sectors will be completely wiped out. So, you know, it's important uh, in these situations that, you know, as we engage with the international community, it should be on the basis of what is best in the best interest of our people. And, um, and this is really what, uh, what is required. And the U.S. does that extremely well. As you know, their sectors um, drive their policy. And I saw this very, very well when I was in the World Intellectual Property Organization, that you know, it would even be the, the uh, practitioners, uh, the, the pharmaceutical industries, and all that, that will come and be forcing the international conventions to be changed in a way that suits them. And in fact, taking the intellectual property uh, uh, aspects, the trade-related aspects of intellectual property to the World Trade Organization, was because the US private sector was complaining that there was a lot of piracy, that their, their, their entertainment industry was losing so much money, their pharmaceutical sectors, uh, their intellectual property rights were being breached, coming kind of to China and all over the world, that they were losing billions and billions of dollars, and that the World Intellectual Property Organization has no enforcement mechanism you know, to decide, first of all, to adjudicate, and, uh, and then to enforce. And the World Trade Organization had that. So they tried to move uh, certain aspects of intellectual property rights to the World Trade Organization. Some countries re resisted, developing countries. So there was a compromise. So they put trade-related, because World Trade Organization only deals with trade. So they said trade-related aspects of intellectual property. And the Americans were able to push it uh, to, the, um, to the WTO. And then they set up a, um, an office the U.S. Trade Representative, and they have a special 301 report on each country and, you know, their, their compliance with international uh, laws in the area, very often world trade, but also intellectual property. And um, so, when, <laughs> well, the U.S. Trade Representative, in his uh, 2017 special 301 report, criticized Nigeria's 2013 guidelines for Nigerian content development in information and communications technology. Why? For requiring local production or utilization of Nigerian material and labor across a broad range of ICT goods and services. Requirements of particular concern to the USTR include server localization mandates, cross-border data flow uh, restrictions, programs to support only local data hosting firms, and provisions that impose burdens on foreign firms by requiring in-country research and development departments, and also requiring the disclosure of source code and other proprietary information. Okay? So is uh, you know, calling out Nigeria on that. But of course, we have to fight back. We have to try and you know, rebalance the international conventions also in our favor. I mean, the US has its own interests because of you know, their strong points. We also have to have ours. And developing countries uh, are also pushing uh, uh, a pushback uh, in these uh, international fora. 
on the enforcement of intellectual property rights. Of course, concern about the scale of the trade in intellectual property infringement is the principal uh, a reason for this TRIPS agreement, uh, as, I, as I told you. And the trade distortion is how the U.S. Uh, puts it. And now, you know, for any bilateral agreements with any countries, the U.S. now will require an intellectual property law, and they will look at the provisions of those laws and make sure that it complies with the TRIPS agreement. But of course, we need to industrialize. We need to key in and benefit from the uh, knowledge economy. And uh, intellectual property is one of the ways to do it, the ICT sector. And we also have to fight back and look at flexibility and how we can also achieve our objectives. And um, the U.S. International Trade Commission actually estimated that losses to the U.S. economy in revenue and jobs due to intellectual property rights violations at the time of the commencement of the, when the TRIPS agreement was, uh, was launched, uh, was 60 billion U.S. dollars. They, 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 they said they were losing uh, because of intellectual property rights violations. And I'm sure that uh, Chief Tony would um, tell you about the musical industry, the jobs and the, 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 the money that's lost because of Alabama market and all the pirated uh, uh, copies, Nollywood and so forth. A film comes out and uh, before you know it, you go to Alaba and it's, uh, it's all over the place. It's the resources. I mean, the, first of all, the creativity that is lost. A lot of you know, very creative Nigerians will just prefer to go out uh, of the country to pursue their film business or their music uh, uh, business uh, because of that. So you know, it's a real challenge. And um, you can see the US was very serious about how to uh, engage uh, with that. The French, for instance, the French have a lot of very strong uh, trademarks, and, um, and they've made it a crime. If you come into the country, you go to China, it's always nice to wear a Rolex that you bought for $10, but uh, if they catch you at the French border, it's, uh, it's a criminal offense, and uh, not even just a question of fine, but you can go to prison. That's how much effort they are making to protect their intellectual property rights uh, around the world. And, uh, and as I said, the principal feature of the TRIPS agreement uh, is really the issue of enforcement. It's not enough to just say, oh, a country has broken an international provision, uh, but how do we enforce it? And the World Trade Organization has retaliatory measures. Uh, they have an a, a, a adjudication body that will decide. And one country can take another country uh, to court uh, for not, um, you know, uh, for breaching uh, acts under the Uruguay uh, trade rounds. Fortunately, Nigeria has not featured actually on the watch list or the priority watch list of the U.S. trade representative. Um, they have this watch list that they put countries on it uh, as, um, as a defaulting country in the last uh, uh, 10 years. But uh, however, the, their watch list does mention uh, 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 Nigeria regarding the sale of counterfeit and pirated products in a number of Nigerian markets. The number of Nigerian markets, I think they could have said Alaba market and others, you know. <laughs> but, um, well, the Nigerian Intellectual Property Watch uh, has also reported the large-scale piracy in the Nigerian film and music industries, as well as the illicit sale of uh, TV program decoders. You know, uh, that's obviously another source of um, you know, piracy. So maintaining effective IPR enforcement is important in maintaining and encouraging investment uh, uh, landscape. You know, a lot of investors will not come if there's just that much um, you know, um, infringement of intellectual property rights. The Financial Times of London had uh, a feature in uh, 2014, and it was titled, Investing in Nigeria, Piracy and Illegal Downloads Hit Nigeria's Film and Music Industries. And the article stated that when Nigeria's National Bureau of Statistics announced that the film and music industries contributed nearly 1.5% uh, uh, to the GDP, uh, some people were very surprised, and you recall that um, when uh, the Minister of Finance a few years ago um, said that um, the GDP uh, was actually was rebased and uh, Nigeria of course catapulted over South Africa as the number one economy uh, uh, on the continent and a lot of it was due to the creative industries you know and um, and the input that, uh, that they were that they were making and um, and this made Nigeria as I said you know become the largest uh, economy in Africa but 
The article noted that the country is notorious for having some of the most rampant levels of piracy in the world. And, um, and, but interestingly enough, talking about piracy, a Nigerian entertainment entrepreneur, uh, I won't mention his name in case he's somewhere here in the room, I don't know, <laughs> was, was quoted as saying that some artists pay pirates to include their songs on mixed CDs so as to try to generate the hype that's needed for corporate sponsorship, which is said to be worth tens of thousands of dollars a year. I suppose sometimes it's say, it said that if you can't beat them, you just have to join them and see how you can, you know, but that's not the ideal uh, situation. And um, a Brookings uh, a report last year titled Figures of the Week, uh, Africa's Entertainment and Media Industry. Noted that while the music industry in Africa has recently experienced strong growth, but poor distribution networks and weak intellectual property laws coupled with rampant piracy represent challenges to long-term growth. Then PricewaterhouseCoopers uh, uh, Entertainment and Media Outlook reported as follows. Nigeria remains one of the world's fastest growing entertainment and media markets with overall growth of 15.7% uh, 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 last year, reaching $3.8 billion. Nigeria's music industry alone is expected to grow at a breathtaking 12.9%, that's compound annual growth rate, almost doubling from 47 million in 2015 to over 86 million projected in 2020. And all this on the back of strong mobile music revenue. According to the report, the rapid growth of the African music industry can be attributed to three factors, demographics, internet penetration, and streaming. And they argued further that in the entertainment and media spending, in, that in the entertainment and media uh, sector, spending is determined more by the age of a country's population than by its comparative wealth. And, uh, and in fact, six in every 10 Africans are under 24 years the youngest population of any region uh, globally. And um, in fact, in this context, I was talking to Chief Tony uh, earlier this morning that you know, the, the music industry uh, can play a role beyond music in this country because it really commands you know, a large percent of the population of this country because we just have such a large youth bulge, uh, as they call it. Um, the uh, Anna Rushman uh, wrote a paper uh, titled Weapons of Mass Construction, the Role of Intellectual Property in Nigeria's Film and Music Industries, and uh, made a close look at other studies um, and came up with, um, you know, with some interesting uh, conclusions. The 2013 Global Innovation Index, Innovation Index ranks Nigeria 120 out of 142 countries between Malawi and Mozambique. According to the same index, Nigeria placed 101 for knowledge creation, 116 for knowledge diffusion, and 106 for creative goods and services. Nigeria also ranked 153 out of 187 uh, uh, countries in the Human Development uh, Index report, which places it in the low human development group, one place above Senegal in a group that ranges from the Republic of Congo at 142 to Niger at 187. So Nigeria is a real contradiction, as if we didn't all know that already. Um, you know, a, an economic powerhouse in the making, but with consistently low levels of human and social development. So all that I've been saying, the conclusions. <laughs> The development of intellectual property, ICT, and um, science and uh, technology uh, uh, innovation policies, by themselves, policies alone will not secure national participation in the global knowledge economy. Other important factors are those that relate to industrial development generally, such as access to finance, that's extremely important. Um, in fact, when we went to China with Mr. President last year, uh, or maybe it was uh, this year even, uh, sorry, last year, yeah, the, the president of China <coughs> identified, I mean, he said that in, in about 30, 
30 years or so, 40 years, I don't know, 40, 50 years, China has lifted itself out, hundreds of millions of people out of poverty. And it's catapulted to a superpower in the world today, economic superpower, and, uh, and everything else. And he, he said that there were really three things. Um, you have to be able to uh, feed uh, your own uh, people, then people with technical skills, your human capacity, and um, finance. You know, you just have to be able to finance that. And, uh, and I remember many years ago, the, um, the then uh, Secretary General, Director General of UNESCO, uh, Federico Mayor, you know, he said that if a country wants to, for the industrial takeoff, a country has to spend at least 2% of its GDP on research and development. And it has to be its own money, you know, because if it's borrowing, then you have to pay back, you just don't, uh, don't reach that stage. So, you know, so policies, yes, are very, very good, building the architecture, but, uh, but you have to have access to, to finance, adequate managerial skills, and the general education levels you know, have to be up. And it's so interesting, you know, with the Asian tigers and a lot of these Asian countries, what they put their children through and the expectations of Asian children uh, with regards to education is unbelievable, unbelievable. You know, it's almost inhuman uh, because they, you know, every parent just wants their child uh, to perform at an optimum level. So if you go to institutions like IMT and things, uh, all Asians uh, that, uh, that inhabit the place. So for Nigeria, intellectual property rights are both a burden and an opportunity. The principal burden is the cost of complying with the various international, regional, and bilateral IP obligations that are imposed uh, on us. Some of them are quite onerous. Compliance with TRIPS as a qualification for member of the World Trade Organization is probably the most significant obligation in this uh, regard because industrialized countries put the bar quite quite high um, On the other side of the ledger is a promise articulated in article 7 of TRIPS as I said that the protection and enforcement of intellectual property rights Should contribute to the promotion of technological innovation and to the transfer and dissemination of technology So, you know, there's a challenge of you know very high standards but there's also this benefit. So consequently for Nigeria, it's important to identify the ways in which intellectual property rights can be used to encourage investment, to underpin research and development, and to enhance the development of industry and to facilitate above all trade. A clear intellectual property rights policy and strategy, so as one of the things I told you we're trying to set up, clear IP policy and strategy coupled with a program of building the necessary implementing capacity will enable the exploitation of any flexibilities in the TRIPS agreement and the use of intellectual property rights as a tool for development. But I really believe that uh, in forging that strategy, it would require a strong partnership between all the sectors, the private sectors, and all the institutions dealing with intellectual property. So ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for your patience.